A federal judge has ruled that former White House counsel Don McGahn must appear before Congress. The case stems from a lawsuit brought by House Democrats. They are seeking McGahn's testimony in the impeachment probe directed at President Trump. And the Trump administration alleges the U.S. Constitution does not give Congress power to compel testimony from senior members of the executive branch. But in a ruling, the judge said that McGahn wanted to assert executive privilege. He would need to appear before Congress to do so himself. Here to weigh on on this is the journalist Michael Tracy and a good friend of the show. Michael, it's great to see you. Great to see you, Michael. Always great to be with you guys. Oh, yeah. So, okay, so, Michael, what does it tell us that the Democrats are trying to relitigate the Mueller report by bringing in Don McGahn and, and, and sparking a national fight to try and get Don McGahn to testify about God knows what? Well, they never really stopped litigating the Mueller report in a literal <laughs> sense. I mean, the Judiciary Committee under Gerald Nadler has been pursuing documents and various materials related to the Mueller report under the auspices of impeachment since July. And that all kind of got brushed aside when this Ukraine issue flared up, but it never stopped. And now that Adam Schiff is going to be referring his report on the Ukrainian aspect of all this to the Judiciary Committee, I think next week, we're probably going to enter a new phase where Mueller becomes front and center again as they put together what the final articles of impeachment will consist of. So for everybody who initially claimed that this was going to be a narrow process and it was going to focus on this you know, contained alleged malfeasance that Trump undertook with respect to Ukraine, I always thought that was crazy because Mueller really laid the foundation for the impeachment fervor to begin with, and there's a continuity there that I think a lot of people in the media neglected to emphasize. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, what was too tantalizing for them to resist was some of the testimony in the Roger Stone case, which seemed to indicate maybe the president lied under oath, and so they want to bring Don McGahn in, and that that's really what made this irresistible for them to go back to the Mueller probe. But you just start to wonder, like, where does this end? I mean, there are just so many threads that they want to pull, all of which have been very much explored before, and none of which have moved the needle with the public and certainly haven't moved the needle at all with Republicans, in particular, any of the Republicans in the Senate who you would ultimately need to convict. Yeah, I mean, if the Roger Stone conviction is really what compelled them to go down this track, then that's an even bigger joke because Roger Stone was not convicted of having a back channel to WikiLeaks. He wasn't convicted of anything that related to the main thrust of what he was even investigated for by Mueller. He was convicted for basically boastfully telling lies, which is what Roger Stone has done for his entire life. And then that got portrayed as bombshell <laughs> evidence that, you know, the theories that have been propagated for years about his centrality to this supposed collusion conspiracy were, were vindicated when they were not. They were actually dispelled. But, you know, there, like you said, there are so many threads to this. And it's so difficult for even journalists who are paid to follow the news to, I think, coherently apprehend everything that goes on with this extremely multifaceted story that you could just put forth a preferred narrative and the casual news consumer is not going to have the resources in terms of their personal time, their energies, their interest to really sift through it. And that I also thought was reflected by even the Ukraine impeachment hearings, because the main thrust of that, as I watched those hearings, sadly, because, you know, I, I don't think that impeachment hearings have to be ex especially exciting in order to be important, but you have to have at least something that's compelling in terms of the pr public presentation. If you feel that a political case is going to be made to, for why the president must be removed. But the main theme of those hearings, I thought, was that National security officials were trotted out by the Democrats as their marquee witnesses to basically complain that their ambitions with respect to Ukraine to further this Cold War mentality were temporarily interrupted by Trump. And those were the people who were exalted as the heroes of the at least establishment anti-Trump resistance. And that's the political message being put, put forward. So I actually mentioned this to you last time. I was on, but if we're going to regard impeachment as a political process, which gets repeated over and over as the characterization of what impeachment consists of, you have to look at the message that's being presented. And what was being presented 
is that Trump inhibited the implementation of what was called official foreign policy. Right. And he ought to have deferred more mindlessly to the national security officials who were never elected to anything, who serve under multiple administrations going back across several under both parties. And they are the caretakers of official foreign policy. It's almost as, as if they possess U.S. official foreign policy in some kind of sacred chamber and that you can't get into that chamber without their approval. It was insane. And what's the end result? Well, one thing that didn't get any attention, really, that I saw in the media coverage of this stuff is that during the very first hearings, the ones that probably most Americans were tuned into, the first two witnesses that were brought forward, William Taylor and George Kent, both affirmed when they were under questioning by William Hurd, the slightly anti-Trump Republican congressman from Texas, that aid to Ukraine never stopped, right? There's a year, uh, there's a lag period of a year before those funds would get dispersed anyway. So one of them made a remarkable statement, which was that just a couple weeks ago, the U.S. taxpayers generously provided Ukraine with some state-of-the-art patrol boats, and they're now in the port of Odessa, and it has nothing to do with Trump allegedly withholding military aid for that right. couple-week period. So Democrats don't deal with the actual policy that has been implemented during the Trump administration with respect to Ukraine. They deal with this narrative version of it that furthers these preconceived notions of what Trump is doing. And it all comes right. back, I think, fundamentally right. to the idea that he's compromised by Russia. I think that that's, that, is a fun, that is a very good insight. And that's why the fundamental policy at dispute of this entire impeachment thing is just as important. But I know that you also wrote a new piece in, M in uh, The Spectator talking about MSNBC coming for Tulsi Gabbard, uh, Tulsi the Dove. I believe we have some sound that was referenced to a particular clip, which is just absolutely hysterical. Let's take a listen to that. I've got Tulsi Gabbard and uh, oh. I got Steve Schmidt up there that took a shot at you a while ago. I want to give him a shot. Steve, would you repeat what you said about Tulsi Gabbard? This woman, I thought your performance was dishonest. Um, I think your positions are extreme. And one question I would have for you is why did you go to Syria to meet Bashar al-Assad? What was the intent of your visit there? And why were you so dishonest with regard to the mayor? insisting that he called for plans to invade Mexico, which, of course, he did not. <laughs> I mean, well, what do you make of that clip, Michael? <laughs> Think about what they did there. Think about yeah. the editorial judgment that was made by Chris Matthews and MSNBC in that moment. They said, oh, Steve Schmidt, please come on and just denounce Tulsi. He didn't even ask yeah. her really a question. Right. To the extent that he formulated that as a question, it was simply to reinforce this idea that she's evil and dangerous. I mean, if you're asking her about the Assad issue now, as if as though she's never addressed it, you're not actually trying to elicit any kind of fact-based response from her. You're just trying to repeat an attack line right. that has been used against her ad nauseum to kind of reinforce that image of her in the public. And it's just insane. MSNBC has essentially dropped all pretenses with regard to Tulsi. They don't even try to hide their contempt anymore and there are other candidates who they are unfair to by you know omitting andrew yang from graphics or not allowing him to have surrogates on some of the tenor of the coverage of bernie is not always positive as you know but in terms of the sheer animus that they show toward tulsi that's unique in the field and that's i think somewhat of a departure correct me if i'm wrong from how msnbc has typically treated democratic primary candidates, obviously they have favorites, yeah. but for them now to just out, almost outlandish in their hatred toward one candidate crosses a certain threshold. And you even saw that in the debate itself when after Tulsi's introductory remarks, one of the moderators, Ashley Parker, just decided to take it upon herself and ask Kamala Harris if she had any response. And if you go back and watch that little exchange, the entire audience started laughing and Kamala Harris started laughing because there was no reason why right. the floor would be given to Kamala Harris. <laughs> yeah. Right, it was just like yeah. they knew. They wanted to instigate an altercation. 
They knew yeah. that Kamala hated her. Right. They knew that she had gotten slammed and destroyed by Tulsi right. before. And so they decided to spark this fight, even though there was no reason to. I mean, I find it ironic, given that MSNBC really came into its own as the sort of um, left-leaning voice against the Iraq war, right? That was, that was when MSNBC became something like the MSNBC we know it is now. But now they've staffed up with all these Bush-era neocons, you know, and like Steve, Steve Schmidt. Schmidt. worked for McCain. Right, <laughs> like Steve Schmidt. <laughs> right. And so, you know, the, it just exposes that, look, it, it was always questionable how much of the left MSNBC ever was. It's always been a corporate venture, et cetera. But it just shows how much their ideological positioning has changed from being the only ones who said anything against the Iraq war to like, you know, um, completely ignoring Biden and everybody else's support for the Iraq war and just completely smearing Tulsi, who is one of the only candidates who has a different view on foreign policy. You know, I think reflecting on that period when MSNBC at least became the nominally left wing channel, you have to now kind of accept that as almost situational on their part. They identified a market that would be lucrative for them. It wasn't as if they had some kind of principled opposition to the Iraq war. Maybe some of them did on, in individual circumstances, but fundamentally they're beholden to whatever the market in intensives are. And right now it's within their market interest to depict Tulsi as an infiltrator, as a Trojan horse in the Democratic right. Party and not deal on the substance with what she's saying, which is why over and over again they tar her as a Russian plant, essentially. Yeah. And there's nobody who could really offer any kind of countervailing view because yeah. it's just not economically advantageous for them it's at this point. Exactly. Well said, it's Michael. exactly yeah. well said. It is completely situational. It's devoid of values. And one thing that's always great for cable ratings is having a villain. They've decided to Absolutely. make Tulsi the villain. Michael, great to see you as always. Thanks, Michael. All right. Great talking to you guys. Next on Rising, Michael Bloomberg is spending more than $30 million of his own money to front his presidential run. But those dollars aren't erasing years of controversies that have followed the former mayor. We're going to dive into a few of those problem areas with journalist Zed Jelani, friend of the show, of course, when Rising continues.